Thank you so much for coming. Oh, no. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our Global Change Seminar. Um, this is hosted by the Global Change Fellows, which are part of the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And um, we're going to talk about food security, uh, food and water scarcity, and the face of climate change. So we're going to explore topics today about how aquaculture, fisheries, and agriculture will be affected by climate change and how this in turn will affect our communities. So I'm going to give a very brief introduction and then let um, our panelists describe their work and themselves in a little bit more detail. We have um, Kamal Bell, who is a farmer and founder of Sincopa Farms in Durham, North Carolina. We have Dr. Rob Dunn, who is a professor in uh, the Department of Applied Ecology here at NC State. And on the screen behind us um, is Dr. Abby Lynch, who is a fisheries biologist with the National Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, and we're really excited to have you all, all today. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to describe a little bit more about your work and your research and how it relates to our topic today. You go first. Yeah, I want to hear you. You go first. All right. <laughs> um, so, so I'm an ecologist. I, uh, I started off working mostly on tropical forest regeneration uh, in post-agricultural landscapes. So mostly in Bolivia, a little bit in Costa Rica, a little bit in Peru as a PhD student, thinking about how long it took those forests to recover after they were used for agriculture. Um, I grew up, I'll back up a little bit. I grew up in Michigan. I grew up in a small post-agricultural town um, there. Went to college at Kalamazoo College in Western Michigan. And at some point early on, uh, got interested in the tropics. And so that brought me to that tropical work. I was always interested in the sort of insect and microbial part of those stories. Um, and so that was a lot of what I was doing then. Um, but I was also always interested in how what was happening in a single farm and a single forest in Bolivia or Peru or anywhere else fit into a big global story. Uh, and the, the field in the context of which I started to study that was a field that we would now call macroecology. At the time, it was often called biogeography. And so it was a field dedicated to figuring out what are the general rules that govern how many species you find in one place versus another, um, and, and why they're there, and uh, how much biomass is in one place or another. But I found as I was doing that work that all the people around me were interested in the very basic parts of those questions that sort of just intellectually fascinating pieces. And fast forward a little bit, when I got here, I found myself surrounded by people who did useful things, who could feed people. And so slowly those two things started to come together and I started to think more and more about how do I blend these skills from ecology, from macroecology, with these real world challenges. And so started to think more and more about how agriculture fits into that story. Um, and so for the context of today, a, a key piece uh, for me for that was that I wrote a book last year, a year and a half ago, called Never Out of Season, sort of positioning global agriculture in the context of the big story of ecology and biodiversity. Um, and then looking forward to think about what does agriculture look like in the future and how do we think about that? Uh, that's one of like eight stories I could tell about myself, all of which are at least partially true. All right. Um, greetings, everybody. I'm Kamal Bell. I'm the founder of Sankofa Farms. And um, Sankofa Farms is a farm that I started in 2015 that seeks to get people who are affected by food deserts fresh and affordable food. Through my journey, I've just had a lot of experiences and um, with, just with society and seeing some things that I would like to change. So instead of uh, complaining about it, I, I just decided to do something about it. So a little bit about my backstory. I'm a graduate of North Carolina A&T and in East Greensboro where North Carolina A&T is, you can maybe walk five minutes outside of campus and you're hit with like 11 to 15 fast food restaurants, just like in a block radius. So if you go to West Greensboro, where UNCG is, you run into like Baba House and these really, really nice restaurants and food outlets like Harris Teeter and Whole Foods. And I start to question why did it look like that on one side of the town and then look like that in, in East Greensboro where I went to school. 
So then I started to think on a larger scale, and I thought about Durham. It's the same exact thing in Durham. So in my time with teaching in the public school, I started to talk to the students about the issues, and I kind of took it really personal because I could see how this disparity affected the children I was teaching. So I have stories about how you hear about how students are hungry all the time, and then you look at the food they're getting in the cafeteria and things just don't add up. So in um, the summer of 2015, I started to take students who I was teaching in the public school setting and bring them out to the farm. So now we're, we have six students into that program, the St. Copa Farms Agricultural Academy, and I'm teaching the students about environmental justice, um, food insecurity, their role, how they can solve it, and what we all can do collectively to get food to the communities where the people look just like us. Thank you, Abby. Great, thanks. Uh, can you all hear me just to confirm before I get going? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And, and thanks again for the invitation and I appreciate the ability to present remotely. Um, I'm up here in DC, so it would have been a little bit, I could have made it down there, but it, logistics today just w wouldn't work out. So I appreciate the opportunity to present this way. Um, and I actually prepared a few slides just because I figured it would be a little bit easier because I'm remote. So I hope this will work um, to share my screen just to get things started. Um, okay. Let's see. Is that working? Yep. Yes. Like it is. Okay, so um, just to put things in the context of uh, what Emily had, had asked me to kind of prepare for, um, I am a research fish biologist with the National Climate Adaptation Science Center and based at USGS headquarters in Reston, Virginia. My um, background is, is um, I, I did my undergrad at the University of Virginia. I did a master's in genetics looking at Atlantic Menhaden at the University or at the Virginia Institute for Marine Science, which is affiliated with William & Mary. Um, then I did a Knauss Fellowship, which is through Sea Grant um, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Fisheries Program. Um, and then I did my PhD at Michigan State University looking at Lake Whitefish, which is a commercial fishery in the Great Lakes and in the context of climate change. And so that's where I started to kind of uh, get interested or in, involved in the field of climate change. And now in my position with the National Climate Adaptation Science Center, I'm sure um, many of you are familiar with this program um, being at, that this seminar is organized by the Global Change Fellows at the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, but this is a, a national network. Um, I'm based at the headquarters office in, in, in Reston and just to run through um, a few projects that we have on our from our aquatics program. Uh, we work across the country, um, so I, I have projects ranging from Hawaii looking at impacts of stream flow on aquatic ecosystems and Hawaiian streams to looking at um, the northern Rocky Mountains and mostly trout fisheries there and looking at the consequences of shifting communities both as a result of climate change and as a result of invasive species and the impacts of that on the, the local economies. Um, we have projects in the south central part of the country looking at the influences of change in climate on, uh, for example, Rio Grande cutthroat trout. Um, we also are looking at uh, things in, in the Great Lakes region. So um, we have a project that's looking at recreational and tribal fisheries, uh, specifically walleye fisheries, which are an important um, economic driver in the region at, as a result of climate change. Um, and then a project that I'm actually working on with one of the Southeast Global um, Climate or the Global Change Fellows, uh, Bonnie Myers and, and Tom Koch at uh, NC State is uh, looking at uh, change within Caribbean fish assemblages. So that's going to be uh, Bonnie's PhD work. And then at a, a national scale, because we're in the national program, we have a, a number of different uh, projects that are looking at larger scale syntheses. Um, mostly focused on aquatic systems, but a, a couple of different programs that are also looking at wildlife as well. Um, and then on a global scale, and this is where uh, most of my work is uh, 
uh, the realm of food security and, and climate change comes in, um, we're looking at a, a number of different projects linking the importance of inland fisheries to um, large scale change and, and um, linking them specifically in with the U UN's um, sustainable development agenda and the sustainable development goals. And um, I just wanted to run through a few quick slides related to um, in, inland fisheries just to, to provide a bit of context. Um, and again, just because I'm remote, it, I feel like it's easier to put things through, through slides. So um, for those, uh, let's see here. So uh, for those that, that aren't uh, super familiar with inland fisheries, um, inland fish make up 40% of all fish species and 20% of all vertebrates. They occupy all major aquatic habitats on Earth. Um, and in terms of production, so fisheries and harvest, um, more than 40% of the world's fin fish production comes from inland fisheries. So uh, just based on the amount of water in the world, and most of that being in the oceans, um, this actually equates to quite a large production of uh, fisheries coming from a very small amount of water. Um, and these fisheries provide food for billions of people and livelihoods for millions of people around the world, um, but they are often absent in water resource discussions. And so um, I and a number of our colleagues have been really kind of uh, investigating why this is and, and what we can do to kind of increase the um, recognition or the, 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 the value of inland fisheries on that global stage. And um, one of the contexts that we found to do that is actually looking through the sustainable development goals, just because this is a, a very holistic approach. It's something that a lot of different countries are interested in engaging in um, this arena. And um, at this point, we have a number of different smaller scale projects looking at how inland fisheries are are um, found to help achieve all of these goals, which cross both um, ecological, economic, and social dimensions. And so just um, very quickly to show one, one um, graphic here in terms of, of the distribution of the importance of inland fisheries to achieving the targets of the sustainable development goals. This is just a quick um, display of of all 169 targets within the sustainable development goals and um, which uh, goals the, the inland fisheries contribute the most to. And, and just to put this in a, in a bit more context, looking at the um, different ecosystem services that can be found through fisheries and, um, and their associated systems. Uh, we've looked at uh, this suite of different services and we found that there are strongly positive impacts between these fishery services and, and 10 different SDGs. And um, just to put uh, it in a little bit more context for, for today's discussion, looking at um, hunger in, in particular, um, that's the second sustainable development goal. And there are five different uh, inland fisheries ecosystem services that, that contribute strongly to helping achieve this goal and the targets within that goal. And then putting it in the context of water security, um, the sixth SDG is, is looking at water and there are four um, strongly positive impacts related to fishery services and, and achieving these goals. Um, and so with that, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context for some of the work that I'm doing and, and hopefully I can help provide the aquatics and fisheries perspective to today's discussion. And um, I just wanted to leave with one last slide on um, two different <laughs> websites. Uh, the first one is, is a large international research network that's called InFesh. And um, we're always looking for more members. This is uh, essentially an organization um, built voluntarily, uh, but it's for folks that are interested in um, looking at the sustainable use of inland fisheries and um, we, we have a lot of different opportunities for collaboration among the network and um, so we encourage you to consider joining if that's of interest. And then the last one is one that's a, an NC State link that I just wanted to plug. Um, I've heard of the fisheries blog and that was something that was uh, near and dear to, to NC State, and, and it was a uh, growth out of a number of grad students that started that program. So, um, 
yeah, but that hopefully that's, uh, I, I know it's, it's a little difficult because I'm remote, but I appreciate the opportunity and hopefully I can um, contribute to the rest of the discussion. Open up the questions um, and I'll start with one. Do you think, um, will climate change affect food and water security? Things like agricultural production, fisheries, um, and so on. If so, what do you see as the major climate change impacts and how will this affect food accessibility? Um, who wants to start this time? I started last time. <laughs> <laughs> This is something that I've been thinking about just going into my third year of farming and just paying attention to the livestock that we have on the farm. Right now we have guinea fowl and um, we have uh, some laying, layer hens. And what I started to see out of, the, um, out of the animals and started to think is the chickens aren't gonna be able to do too well when it gets hot. Is anybody, does anybody here have a farming background or a little bit? Well, what happens with the animals when, when the temperature rises is similar to what happens to us. We get hot, irritated, and their production goes down. And I was thinking, in 10 years, I don't think you'd be able to raise these animals on pastures. This, this is just me. But the quality of the, the meat that you're going to get is, is going to be very different. That's why we ended up switching to um, guinea fowl. Because if you, know, if you don't know about guinea fowl, they actually are from West Africa, so they can tolerate the, uh, the climate change a whole lot better than the chickens. But the downside, they aren't as domesticated as the chickens. So if they escape, you can't catch them on foot. You have to think of some innovative way to get them back in. That's just the downside. But as far as the quality of the meat and the durability of the animal, I think that's probably a change that some farmers would have to make if they um, want to stay in business. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think there are lots of agricultural issues at different scales and Kamal's raised like a, a low, uh, these questions of what, what's happening at a local scale. You're farming in a place. How do you deal with these changing climates? I think if you pan back and think globally, I mean, one of the things we're already starting to see is that regions that have relatively difficult climates for farming, uh, many of those regions it's going to get even more difficult and in those places where we've coupled like industrial agriculture with relatively few kinds of crops with with difficult climates those are going to be places where we see lots of unrest that has global consequences and so i actually think that's one of the most direct global things and i think there's a strong argument to be made that part of what we're seeing and what we've seen in syria relates to what happened with climate change and agriculture in both Iraq and Syria, which precipitated political unrest. And so we'll see more of, of that. Um, and those same regions that are gonna face the worst challenges globally are some of the regions we invest the least in agriculturally. And, and so I, I think that's a big, big challenge. Um, and the, the, um, the the teeny amount we invest in like the Fertile Crescent in agriculture right now, I mean, it's really, really small. And I mean, that's a sort of example of a region where stuff is going to be hard. I think the other thing that's going to happen really quickly is that we're going to see lots and lots of species of pests and pathogens moving really quickly. And our data on those pests and pathogens are super poor. Um, and so, for example, uh, we don't have a very good database of the fungi associated with uh, major crops in most regions. There's a USDA database, but you can't actually extract all the data from it. You can extract it species by species and it's not very complete. And so like, if you think about what's gonna happen in Florida where you're at the tip of a climate zone and a bunch of new things are gonna be able to live in Florida, how do we learn about those species? Um, and we're not ready for that. And so I think that's another major change. In North Carolina, we will see a lot of that. And it will turn up that you know, our weakened extension system will work with one, for some farmer to see some new pest that turns up and will respond as fast as we can, but the rate of that is gonna accelerate. And then I think the other big challenge, and I'll pass to Abby, and there's lots we could talk about obviously, is that the in a lot of regions, the number of people in whose hands um, 
agriculture is held is declining, right? That fewer people, fewer companies own the seeds, own the means of production. And so as climate changes, we rely more and more on those relatively few companies to keep up with climate change on our behalf. And so you, um, there are some pretty clever scientists at Monsanto, but we're gonna have to rely on those scientists to be thinking 50 years ahead. And that's almost never their goal. And so, and so I think those are all pretty big challenges. Yeah. And uh, I, I can just echo that. I, so I come from the perspective of fish and fisheries, but I think a lot of the same issues that, are, that Kamal and Rob have, have presented on the agricultural side also affect aquatic ecosystems. We have um, clearly documented changes in fish communities and fish distributions and fish populations. Um, the issue of potentially invasive species affecting native fish communities and how that then transitions up to food um, sounds very similar to, to what they both have described in terms of agriculture settings. Um, I think uh, another issue uh, with relation to aquatic systems and, and food coming from aquatic systems and particularly inland systems is a lot of these locations um, are across the globe are in very remote settings and um, they're often highly rural where uh, monitoring and um, assessment of them is limited and so having no baseline for knowing how how much food is coming from a certain water body uh, makes those fisheries particularly vulnerable in the context of climate change and other global change in that um, there's no way for us to assess how how large of an impact um, the fishery is having on food security in the region and then what impact a potential change if, uh, for example, a population of fish collapses and um, what impact that'll have through society. So. And so I think this goes right into our, the next question that the fellows have sort of posed, which is um, you've talked about regions generally, but are there regions or what regions or communities would be most impacted by these changes? Um, and so Abby, I think specifically for you, this would, would, would look like how will communities be impacted by these shifts in fisheries? Um, and then also talking a little bit about marine and freshwater, um, the differences there um, within those communities. So ones that rely on inland fisheries versus marine fisheries. And then for Robin Kamal, I think this is um, more related to y'all about how will communities be impacted by these changes to agriculture um, or you know, talking about pests and things like that. And then I think um, also how could managers or what could managers or community leaders do to adapt or mitigate these effects? Oh. <laughs> okay, should I start? That's a, that's a big question there, but yeah. I, can, I, I can try to at least tackle uh, the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think, so trying to link both uh, marine and inland, one uh, proposed solution, and maybe this is uh, going towards an agriculture approach, but um, a, a lot of different communities propose using aquaculture as an alternative to wild harvest fisheries, both in inland systems and in uh, marine systems. And I think one uh, issue of particular reservation or hesitation with going in that approach. So um, when you have uh, decision makers realizing that they're, they're losing a wild caught fishery, um, they, there's often a proposition to just replace that with uh, an aquaculture species. And um, the, the reservation or hesitation with going that approach is that often those um, aquaculture species may not necessarily directly replace both the nutritional um, and just basic calorie content of, of the, the lost wild harvest fisheries. And um, there's also a kind of a social economic dimension there in that um, aquaculture is usually uh, requires some investment funding to start up and the individuals that operate in the realm of wild more subsistence-based harvests are not often able to make that transition to um, an aquaculture setting. So there, there are definitely limitations with just accepting that um, a wild fishery would be lost in both marine and inland settings, but 
um, with the expectation of global change in both a climate change context and also just a land and resource use change context um, that will affect these resources. Uh, it's important to kind of recognize the, the value of the current resource and, and, um, and then what would potentially replace that. I know that doesn't get at all of, all of um, your question, but maybe that's just a little bit of something to start things off. <laughs> That's great, Abby. I, mean, I like that we have like totally complementary answers to all these questions and perspective is good. Um, so, I, uh, so another way to look at this question is to think about like what are the structural features that are going to make and, and biodiversity features some regions more at risk than others. And so I, I think like the, you know, marginalized people, uh, countries, regions more at risk, less power to respond to change less able to shift in response to change, especially when it happens quickly. We're seeing that with, with hurricanes, right? Like who, who has the money to afford to be able to build up after hurricanes? Um, and the same thing has happened with agriculture. Um, I also think that the uh, regions that have less power and money and have simplified agriculture are gonna be at risk. Brazil uh, has dramatically simplified agriculture and not done a great job of, of managing resistance to those new transgenic crops. And so those transgenic crops in Brazil face huge threats. Um, but a lot of the diversity of approaches that used to be there are not there. And so that's a sort of hot spot of, of problem. Um, and then when, where climate's changing fast and where it's changing toward conditions that are pretty hard for agriculture. And so I think like the, the worst case places are simplified agriculture, relatively marginalized, lots of change at a, at a global scale. And obviously within a region that, that looks really different. Um, so within a region, I'll, I'll, I'll pass to come on. So I'm just thinking about like the communities that we attempt to serve and like specifically the people of South Durham and East Durham would get it, they would just adjusting to a different food system we get it really, really bad. Um, and I see that based on economics, the placement of grocery stores. The, the only way I can see this issue being solved is, this is a really hard thing to do, but getting people to change their eating habits, I think that's gonna be really, that's gonna be a factor in it. Um, people really, 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 really love me. But I've talked to a lot of people and I do plan on going to Africa because our, our farm, our theme of everything is Africa Sankofa. And the type of, the meal setup is completely different there. So the, the majority of what you'll eat is millet there. And then you'll eat vegetables and then meat. So if we can get people to, to get off of, of certain items, I think that could be a way that we could adjust and, and deal with climate change from um, the food aspect, but then Thinking about bees, we have six beehives. I, and just to give you like a, a quick disclaimer, you can ask 10 beekeepers a question, you'll get 10 different answers. So you might talk to another one and you're like, man, that guy was crazy. But just looking at how Italian bees do in heat and then researching Africanized bees and looking at how the climate's changing, I really think that as things continue to, um, I guess, go south, like in a bad way, I think that we're gonna to have to even switch up how we keep bees. I, I don't think that the European bee is gonna be our bee of choice anymore. I think we have to move to Africanized bees. I think that's going to, that's going to really change how we consume honey and, our, and pollinators in the environment. If you don't know Africanized bees, they have a tendency to swarm. So a swarm is when 60% of the beehive leaves and then the, the bees that stay back, they raise up a new queen, they take the old queen and they go off and they develop a new hive. So you got to deal with that. You're also going to have to deal with the behavior. They're smaller and they tend to chase you more. So I can go into a European beehive and maybe run 50 feet away and be fine. If the bees are Africanized, I'm looking up to 500 feet to a mile so the bees get off of me. So I think that's really going to be a, um, be an issue in the future. So I think it's a really, really complex question. And I just know that marginalized communities are really gonna get hit harder because we don't control our food source. So one thing that I noticed and I try to do is just try to raise up a new generation of farmers who will 
take the environment into consideration as they're producing food because we have to be we have to have regenerative practices with agriculture because if just developing a farm from literally an area where there were acres of trees to having two acres of clear space you tear apart the earth and you you reflect on it and then tell, ask yourself okay I know that if I keep going at this space, my son, who you just saw, won't be able to farm this way because we'll just tear it apart. So you have to think about new ways and just get those ways to the youth. And then you have to deal with getting youth into agriculture. That's a whole nother monster in itself. So it's, it's a really complex problem. Can I follow up a little bit too? The, I think Kamal's brought up twice this question of um, how do you figure out which species you're gonna use in the future? And I think that raises a, a point, which is that I mean, a lot of you are students, and a lot of these questions, um, we've actually not addressed them very earnestly, and, and sometimes they're not actually that hard. And so, for example, figuring out what are the most likely crops from the global portfolio of crops to grow in particular regions of the Southeast and the future under different scenarios. Uh, it's not easy, but, but it's, we do comparable things with rare warblers all the time. And, and yet there's not a good model for which, which crops, you know, like if you're going to look for what things should I be growing given the future scenarios, you, you go and talk to somebody who might know or you, you rely on your own insights about the bees, which is like, that, that's the situation. And so I think that we, as scientists, we could do a much better job of really figuring out like what are these necessary next steps? And so that's an example, like which things could be farmed here in the future given soil, and given future climates, and then what's that range of things? Um, and then at the same time, being pretty serious about which climate scenarios are most likely. That as scientists, we like to say, well, there's this range, but I think our intuition is actually that there's a couple that are getting more and more likely. And, and for farmers, you need to know that. And then I would say also for pests and pathogens, we also need that. What, what are the pests and pathogens that Kamal and his farm should help keep an eye out for that if they show up, we need to know immediately. That tool is not available, and we could do that. We know what to do to do it, and we just haven't. And Mitch, were you going to say? I was just going to add that what you just said about the species identification and maybe the future, uh, and then your earlier comment about the beach production being in a very limited number of hands. Um, it seems like you know those groups, the Monsanto's of the world, are going to be probably the most likely to either develop the species of the future or identify those. So I'm just I'm wondering what the, the possible outlooks are for, for that confluence of, of sort of the science capacity and you know, economic interest in it and, and, and sort of the reduction of diversity and you know, digging ourselves into a, maybe a deeper hole by, by reducing that, that diversity over time, by, you know, by developing yeah, I mean, my, my, pers my personal perspective is that those companies have a lot of clever folks, right? So, like, and I know good folks who work in companies that um, uh, it's easy to not like for a variety of reasons. Um, but, but at the same time, they have very few incentives um, uh, to look 20 or 30 years into the future. Lots of incentives to look into the very near future and they're able to think about where they're growing things at a global scale. So, if, I mean, I've heard conversations that about if agriculture has a big, if transgenic crops have a big fail in Brazil about where to then move them and which non-transgenic crops to then move in. Now, so there's a plan, there is a longer term plan but that's not a plan that's very good for any of the people involved in, in that production. And, and so I think that's the, you know, even if those companies are really, if, if they think further into the future than I think they do, they're thinking about it in a very different way from what we as, uh, as consumers, as people who would like social justice with regard to food, who would like diverse food, I think about it. Um, and, and so, I mean, I think that we're not gonna change that those companies exist right but we can balance that portfolio in our communities and globally um and so i think it's not useful to say let's, well, let's destroy that model because that's not going to happen tomorrow but can we balance that model and like what kamal's doing is amazing in this context i think 
much to that. I mean, there's no real answer to your question, but yeah. Did I talk about it in a useful way? Optimism or pessimism, but yeah, no, I mean, I I guess the idea of sort of scaling up the, what the model's doing to sort of, you know, try to they start matching that, that, uh, that scale of production. Abby? Or we are, we already circled through once, huh? <laughs> yeah, no, Abby, do you have anything to add to this, please? Um, I, I guess I, I just find it interesting um, to, to see the parallels between kind of the questions that, that you all are struggling with on the agriculture side and, and how similar they are in, in, a, in a fisheries context too. Um, and like that, I'm curious uh, for Kamal and Rob in terms of the idea of including diversity versus like monoculture approaches. I know um, in a fisheries context, we, we talk more about having um, more population diversity so that we can have like a, essentially a greater range of, of um, fish that are able to cope with changing conditions. I don't know what um, on an agriculture side, like do you do that? At a local scale versus up to a global scale, what what are the, the the approaches and methods that you guys use to try and kind of hedge that that vulnerability envelope? Well, since I'm not really tied, like just starting the farm, I'm not tied to like a I don't have like a money maker that I have to depend on. So I'm flexible just to be able to assess certain situations and keep my own data to, top, to try to adjust. I think it has to start on the local level first, and then you just look at what factors exist in your local area, and as many people try to do it locally. But I think another issue is just getting farmers to buy in that this is actually a problem. I think that doesn't exist right now. Um, you could talk to farmers and some of them just wouldn't care. They're just thinking, because yeah, you're literally thinking about how to get from year to year, literally, and how to keep your farm afloat. So this is a really hard issue. I, but I think it just has to start with, I mean, just a couple of people doing it at a local scale. And then we work with them, see what their findings are in that region or that little area has their own practices, but it's going to be really tough. I'm going to punt and I'm going to ask Matthew for his thoughts on this question. Matthew Booker from History, historian of agriculture. What do you think, Matthew, about? Ruining my chance to ask a question. Oh. So I'm going to call Monty back as a question. Oh, perfect. Um, last week I talked about um, seeds and history of seed in the United States in agriculture. And uh, one of the points that I made was the U.S. Department of Agriculture in 1898 creates the Office of Seed and Plant. And so before there was crop breeding, really widespread crop breeding in the US, there was varietal introduction. So they sent people all over the world to look for better versions of the crops we had. Um, that's how car caught wheat came to the US. So that term wheat's not a part of it, wheat's why wheat becomes a great crop of great plains. It's these introductions of varietal. It's not breeding in new crops, it's going to pay. So the US, the uh, US Fisheries Commission is introducing fish all over, from all over the world into different estuaries. Now in the 1950s and 60s and since, that's like kind of a Can you move closer to the microphone, please? Oh, he, he's across the room. That's a, um, let's see, can we move a mic to, to Matthew? No. Can you summarize all this in two seconds? <laughs> <laughs> so my point is that introductions used to be a major method of grappling with change. And in fact, U.S. agriculture is much more diverse in 1920 than it was in 1890. And so, one of the, and the ways they dealt with change in those years, of adapting wheat to new climates in the U.S., was bringing in better varietals, which I think was Mr. Bell's point. You know, choosing plants, choosing species. So that's a, got a bad reputation amongst ecologists today. But I wonder if, it, in fact, one of the best things we can do is simply choose, since we acknowledge change is occurring. We need not maybe the Monsanto's of the world, but maybe the USDA and the State Agriculture Commission to once again go around the world. I think yeah, so, so if I can reiterate so Matthew made several elegant uh, eloquent elegant points that, I, that I'll miss but one, one aspect of it was that 
that there was a time when we, we found best varieties from around the world and gathered them to have a diverse portfolio. And could we do that again? And what would it look like? Um, yeah, and I think it's really, I mean, one of the places maybe you do see it a little bit is in the horticultural context. And that's also where you see plants moving really quickly with climate change and it's aesthetic. People want the plants they find lovely as quickly as they can get them. And so there are now good data showing that horticultural plants are, are moving lockstep with even tiny incremental climate changes because people realize I can get this to survive all winter. Um, and, and so that's actually an interesting model for this. And it's moving much faster than you know, the big ag. That's not a good answer, but it's another part to the story. Any other questions from the audience? And feel free to raise your hand if anybody has any questions to add. Um, but we can go ahead and move on to another question, which is how can you mobilize the public to take action on issues regarding things like agriculture, food and water security? And then what are things that you have done um, within your own work to sort of, uh, to address this, to mobilize the public or to get the community um, invested in these uh, changes? What I've found best that works on a, a local level is finding a, a demographic and tying a cultural piece and then tying in the food piece and then showing how the issues aren't independent of each other. Because you can talk about housing, you're talking about food, you talk about health, you can tie all those issues in together. Finding that common ground and working with people. I found that to and then add in the cultural context and how it affects the culture and that demographic and the history behind it. I found that to work very, very well in the school and out inside the uh, communities where the, our students are from. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, I think exactly what Kamal said on uh, scaling that up to an international level, I think that's what the sustainable development goals that the UN have put forward are trying to do. So they're, they're trying to consider these large global problems in a very holistic context. So not only just thinking about food, but thinking about the culture and the economic consequences of what you do. So um, I, th I think it, it, it helps either at a local scale or a global scale to, to be able to appeal to um, your appropriate stakeholders. So if they're the decision makers, you have to explain to them why um, you know, maintaining this fishery or changing to this fishery um, is important and valuable to them and to their constituents. Yeah, I mean, th those points were both made better than I could make them. What I would add is vote. I mean, a lot of these are issues that have core policy components, environmental policy, agricultural policy. Um, and so we, we need to elect people who implement strong policy with sustainability uh, in mind. Um, and, and so I think we sometimes we, we imagine that we, that we can fix all of these things on the ground with our hands. And I think we can, we can do really important things individually, like in Kamal's model, which is amazing. But, but it works best when we have the policy uh, leverage in place to make th this local work have great, great consequences. And, and so please vote. I, I, I would like to piggyback off of that. I'm just going into a little bit about our story. I was originally denied my farm. Um, I went to the USD FSA. And if the right person wasn't in, um, in office at the time, because they have a, a partisan position. So it's just based on whoever is elected. So um, it was on a democratic term because the president was Democrat. So Bob Edwards was in, in our office, I like to say, it's a pretty important position. So I had to actually appeal through, my appeal went through DC and then he ultimately pushed it through. So just depending on who's sitting in, in that seat, depend was really contingent on if I have a farm at the time or not. So we actually have a question from the chat room. So Annie would like to know, when thinking about introducing new species from crop production or even livestock um, from the global portfolio to adjust to climate change projections, are there ways to consider ecological consequences like invasive noxious species, or is this a concern? Y yes. 
Um, I mean, I think one part of the answer is a lot of those species that are in the global portfolio have already been introduced here in one form or another, right? Um, uh, I mean, I think anytime you're moving species, there are concerns. I think at the same time, like the scale of movement now is, is so different from anything it's ever been that it's a different kind of question than it used to be. I'm fascinated by this Florida question that the tip of Florida is essentially subtropical. And if you think about which species are gonna move we, we talk about like in the Americas, helping species move north if they need to meet, move north with climate change. But the species that need to move north to Florida is, is all of the species of Central America. And that's their like natural trajectory given climate change. But they're discontinuous from that tip of Florida because of the desert Southwest. And so how do we think about that kind of movement? So I think we're in a new, it's a new ball game for moving species which means it makes the answers even harder than they used to be. So that's a little, I mean, that, which is why I said yes, because I think it's a, it's a big, hard question. Ryan, were you gonna say something about that? I think it's getting at the, this, this policy conflict between introduction of, of things for beneficial reasons and this other policy world of um, habitat restoration and, and, and maintaining nature to what we think of as being native when, Today's native species were yesterday's invasives. So we can, we can think about some areas that really will want to support change, allow for change, and foster the change. And at the same time, we have conflicting policies that really say, no, 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 we don't want change. We don't want um, change that could become what we would consider to be invasive or uh, detrimental to a natural habitat or natural species. But those things are always in, in, in conflict, right? The, the Africanized bees that may be more beneficial for some things may also that outcompete the native bees that we want for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I don't see um, is a, is a, a, a structure um, or even science to, to support how we, how we blend those policies or test different policy options that allow for those, those things to not be in direct conflict and can actually maybe, maybe come to resolution. Yeah, I think they're a really important um, scientific cultural differences in how we talk about them. Like the honeybees are a really good example, right? The Africanized bees are non-native, but so are the European honeybees. And they're even arguably non-native in much of Europe, right? And, and so they move with humans, um, but we appropriated that part of the agricultural story as, as part of our, in our sort of native uh, story of species. Um, and so they're almost never talked about in that context, in an agricultural context, versus like the Africanized bees are, right? And so a lot going on there that's problematic, right? Um, and, and all of this is speeding up and how do we think about it? Um, and the historians have lots to, to say on this that's, that's very intriguing, but it, it's a hard question. It's gonna get harder before it gets easier, I think. And the, again, the policy part's really important. Yeah, and just to... To add to that, I, I think it's it's really interesting because it's getting more difficult, but climate change is, is expediting the fact that we need to really consider these kind of changing definitions and what we consider native species and non-native species, and then the non-native species becoming invasive species as the, the climate changes. Um, those things are gonna happen whether or not we have the appropriate philosophical definition of what these things are, but in terms of policy ramifications and, and implications of that, um, if a manager is going to decide that the Africanized bees are non-native and need to be eradicated in certain situations, how, how do they define kind of when when the use and is appropriate? And yeah, I don't I don't have the answer to that, but um, it's it's going to be a question that managers have to have to answer. Um, and 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 I think there are situations where they already need are having facing those consequences. So, but I think for the I mean the graduate students in the audience who seem to be ma many, which is great, um, th that you have a chance to help reframe these conversations in light of where we are today, and especially across disciplines, right? Which which is a big part of the problem is that the language we're using in different disciplines, the conceptual frameworks, the policy is all different, but. I mean, with the Global Change Fellows especially, I mean, you're coming from all over the place in terms of disciplines. And so you have a chance to rethink the, these things in a way that 
we failed to. Um, so let us let us help you, but then do it and, and run with it. I think. So um, Rachel wants to know if the panelists could address the impacts of changing water availability on agriculture and both marginalized and remote uh, subsistence communities. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I could start on the um, aquatic side of things. So just um, in terms of inland fisheries, uh, most of these on a global scale are remote and subsistence communities. Um, I think there's an interesting dynamic with agriculture um, in that often many of these subsistence fishers are also farmers and um, and there's a, a conflict or a, a need to optimize water use for their agricultural com component of their livelihoods and then allowing enough environmental flow for production of, of fish and fish communities. So um, I think the, the struggle uh, in many communities is, is they don't actually have a way to assess fisheries. So often the, the water resource user that gets prioritized is agriculture, even in a context where maybe more of their livelihood or more of their food security comes from the fish component of that. Um, I know that's not really a, a, an answer and I don't know what the solution is to that, but just recognizing that the there are kind of multiple water resource users and trying to optimize water availability will continue to be a struggle, especially as the climate changes and water becomes potentially more scarce in these vulnerable locations. I don't have anything use, super useful to add to that. I don't think I have anything on it either. Um, I, I have studied a model. I don't think it worked too well, but um, Thomas Sankara, he motivates people to try to become independent of a larger system and drill their own wells. I mean, I don't, I know that the groundwater can still be polluted, but if and harvest your own rainwater and try to conserve it, I, I mean, we do it on the farm, but it goes straight to the animals. So we don't, we don't personally drink it, but I don't, I, that's just what we try to do to, to, to deal with like small issues is try it out there. If it works there, maybe it'll work on a larger scale. There are probably people in the audience who can also speak to the water issue if we want to. There's the water experts in here on campus anyway. Water stuff's hard. I mean, it's going to get harder. Uh, it's especially hard in places where people have very little power. That, that feature seems the same. The water problem is To, it's, it's one of those, I mean, water is one of those things that once you lose it and once you lose clean water, moving back in the direction of having it again is a very difficult direction. And we've been seeing this in the context of tap water that there are very few, in, in Europe, it's not uncommon for urban tap water systems to be based entirely on unfiltered, untreated water 
from the aquifer. But that requires that water to not be polluted, to be biodiverse, to have a big watershed. And as soon as you, you bust that, then you lose that ability to have that water in which you have that entire service um, and you get the end result that's better in a lot of ways than what you get in say New York. But it's hard to go backwards to what you had with water. We have enough time for maybe one more question. So if anybody in the audience or in the chat room has uh, a question they'd like to ask, feel free to raise your hand and let us know. Yeah. So um, for the last question, I'm just really curious um, because of things like um, food deserts, um, especially within like some marginalized like, urban communities, um, do you think that an increase in things like backyard gardens or recreational um, fisheries could help decrease the impacts of, um, I guess, climate change that we're going to see in the future, um, especially when it comes to food access? Or how, I guess, or how else can, I guess, communities adapt to become more resilient to? Um, yeah, I, I guess I can start just uh, briefly on the aspect of subsistence fishing in um, more uh, developed countries. It, I, we have, um, we're working on a study that's looking at examining kind of that um, hidden fishery or, or hidden recreational harvest uh, within the U.S. And, and all signs point to the fact that there is actually quite a large um, number of subsistence fishers, uh, even in, in U.S. So they're basically recreational um, fishermen that are using their harvest for a large a substantial component of their food um, intake or nutritional intake. So um, it, it's difficult because those are often considered invisible and you don't see that as a part of, of a traditional American diet, um, but it is in, in the case of many marginalized communities. So um, I, I think the uh, person who asked the question is, is right in that uh, trying to think in the context of creating a more resilient uh, food system often it includes adding elements of diversity to that and, and recognizing that you can get food from, from different sources and um, maybe a factor moving forward is, is, is kind of informing those or having a way to interact and engage with those communities to let them know um, and especially like the work that Kamal is doing and, and kind of um, looking outside of your traditional diet to um, kind of look at more resilient options in the face of climate change. One thing that I've seen to be, because I've thought about that before, and um, Dick Gregory touched on it in um, Soul Food Junkies, and he was talking about just the space that marginalized communities had, like in the 50s, when you're living in a specific area compared to now, like you had your own backyard, but now it's not like that. And then you couple in gentrification with it where people are just getting moved everywhere. So I, just as a teacher, I can ask my kids on any given day, like how many of y'all have lost your house or know someone who's lost their house like in the last two years? Because Durham is just fine all over the place. And the students, like I'll have at least like 25 to 50% of the class raise their hand. So then when you talk about like the backyard gardening, the, pe the people are trying to get, literally are trying to survive day to day. So we did a, a project in um, a community in Durham called Rochelle Manor, and we were collecting data, and we were getting ready to start a, a garden there with the people. So we're sitting in the leasing office for about two hours, and people are literally coming in with problems. Like, like I, I paid my rent, I don't want to get evicted. And you're just like, dang, like, I feel kind of selfish. I'm trying to talk to them about a community garden and their kid doesn't have health care. I mean, even though those things are tied together, just getting people to see that, I felt kind of selfish just even bringing that to the people. But if the people have more of a sense of belonging, they'll, they'll work and, and produce food for themselves. But then there also comes like the economic piece of ownership. If the people can start saving money and then they start thinking like, dang, I did this. My hospital bills are down. I saved money on food. I should buy this place. That changed the whole landscape and the whole power dynamic. So I think we would have to address like certain issues with the power structure to see, okay, how can we maneuver through this? Because that's, that's going to be a, um, an issue. 
But if also if these community gardens were in conjunction with larger farms, like small farms, and then the small farms were in conjunction with larger farms, if there was a whole system, I think it would be perfect. But there's just a divide between urban gardeners, small farmers, and large scale farmers where if that can be worked out, I can see the system being very, very uh, beneficial. Can I ask a follow-up question, which is like, how, how can this community help you in doing what you're already doing? Well, by stuff like this, um, just being able to talk with individuals. But then I don't know what everyone has to offer in the crowd, but uh, in the audience, but people can, people in the audience can be thinking about, I, I know ways that we can help Kamal do this work. So just talking afterward and we, us just bridging the gap and um, access to information because y'all have information that I don't have or I wouldn't come across if I researched the whole year by myself. So just like the sharing of information will really help. Well, that's about the end of our time, but thank you so much to our three panelists um, for all of your uh, answering all our questions today. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Nice to see you, Abby. Yeah, nice to meet you guys. Remotely. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs>